Dr. K. Um, I'm a security researcher. The past couple of years, I've been looking at um, different types of software and some hardware things and looking for vulnerabilities and applying my uh, research, uh, vulnerability research skills to doing that. So, please don't ask me any box questions because I can all answer them. <laughs> so, stands for supervisory control and data acquisition. Um, there's a lot of different terms uh, that describe different uh, components of um, some words referred to as uh, industrial, industrial control systems, ICS, and distributed control systems, DCS. And then uh, you have the HMI um, operator control banks, and they control uh, different devices in the field, um, PLCs, RTUs, things like that. So, the bulk of the presentation is focused on the uh, HMI, hacking the uh, operator stations. And once you get into the operator stations, you know, they control the field of devices. So that is a big target for attackers. Hacking the software because they run you know, Windows, usually, or Linux, some of them. But usually it's Windows XP or something simple. And the control stations are also used to do you know, browsing internet and other, other things which are in different, different places. So, I'll show you a traditional um, setup for uh, SCADA topology. Or, and if uh, my laptop is off the slide, that'll be awesome. Um, so here's just a setup. You have the control system layout. Um, you have the other uh, parts of the network. And it's kind of separated from uh, you know, the ICTP server, the story, and different parts from the corporate land. But you can see, it say the HMI uh, workstations are connected to the internet. So once you, you know, own them with something, some kind of activex exploit, any kind of uh, you know, client side, very popular these days, mainly because servers are kind of, kind of running out of room. They exploit servers and clients are uh, where a lot of the juicy stuff is, all the vulnerabilities. So you see, they're on the same control system land. HMI computer is on, you have access to this storage machine database server. Acquisition, all the engineering machine, four stations, things like that. And then they go out and control the field of us. You have control of RT, PLC, things like that. So that's just kind of overview. And as newer products compete to make SCADA system uh, intuitive and modern, you can see the number of attack vectors tries. Um, about six months to a year ago, I was looking at my iPhone at the App Store, and I just decided to pop in the word SCADA just to see if anyone had come up with anything that would be really uh, interesting to look at with control systems. So I typed it in and I found this application called SCADA Mobile. And you can see here, it, uh, it, it's kind of like a program that controls, and this is actually controlling a PLC and uh, different aspects of what's going on remotely at the uh, control system. So for, what is it? Uh, yeah, 299 for the live version and save it for now for the full version. You know, as things get more modernized and you can see uh, the control system operators be able to control things remotely through their iPhone. What about when you still pretty pretty interesting on that. So I want to go into what's what's what I found to be wrong in at least a lot of the SCADA systems in regards to software loss. Uh, you went with others, uh, bad programming practices, things like that. But uh, here's the same, some of the things I found in all this case stuff. Security has been built or implemented as an add on instead of being built around the product from the ground up. Uh, you know, back in the you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were building these programs to work with uh, you know, the civil protocols. Just, the key is to make things work and work reliably. So, security, uh, back then, not everything was networked. And security was a real concern because you had to have physical access or you had to know, you had to be an engineer to figure out how to connect with things. Nowadays, they're all over the internet. A lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them are, as you can see, be able to control over the internet. And here's uh, some of, a couple of examples of some things I found uh, articles providing new versions. And there's an OPC tunnel from Magicon, uh, now with encryption and data encryption. And you see, and you saw, uh, we're like some great new security features in IWS7. They're just adding these things on instead of looking at the secure architecture and building things where they're looking for attacks. They're looking to evade attacks. They're saying, okay, we realize this is vulnerable, which is good, and we're adding security features, but as anything, any new feature you know, can be evaded all the time. 
So, for example, new security features have been added based on recommendations from some compliance things. And for ClearScan, which is a pretty popular self management software, talk about automation, maybe you may know that thing. Choices for which I'll, uh, they, instead of DMV3 authentication, security DMV authentication, which is probably just some encryption, but uh, you know, they're stepping up, but it's more, it's not being built from the ground up, it's an add on. So there's always fault and stuff like that. Another thing, systems are typically installed for long term. The software upgrades might be required in hardware. Um, when a <laughs> facility goes and purchases, makes a big purchase of um, their new systems, you know, the, the company provides them a lot of times with the hardware and the software. And they say, you know, this, they have a plan that's going to last for 10 years, 20 years, whatever. And a lot of times, when things change, vulnerabilities come out, and they say, hey, you know, we, need, we need patches for these things. A lot of times, the systems are so old and the hardware is so, uh, you know, not up to date, they can't even handle the new versions coming. They say the company may release a security fix for, say, version one is vulnerable to this attack, version two. Uh, may include the fix. And they may, they may uh, make people upgrade version 2 just to get the fix. So that's another problem there. You're waiting, okay, do I have to spend, do I have more systems in my network or do I spend money I don't have for a new upgrade? So that's another problem. And then downtime. Uh, nobody likes downtime. Depending on the product and environment, just planning the patch process. You know, it's just frustrating. A lot of you work IT security and uh, management.
And then uh, I'll show some examples of some auditing I've been doing with the uh, software. And this one is authentication. You've got problems. And anyone in here does reverse engineering or has uh, worked with audit pro before, um, you have to assume above this graph that there's no authentication to get here. But basically what it is is a uh, jump table. And the way this software works, the protocol, you send it a command. You send it in the form of a number or something. When I figure out the protocol, and then I give what commands to send it. And you send it a command, and based on the command, it goes down to the table and executes the uh, block. So on this one, I just, for, uh, I'll show you in a second the, the code that deals with this too. But this one, you send it, say, I, and it goes, it executes that block. Six, that block, seven, that block. And there's no authentication, and the, and the uh, numbers are functions of the program running. So here is part of the proof of concept I came up with. It, it was a server sitting on a uh, computer, which was uh, uh, some SCADA software. And you, like for example, for the previous one, you send it a five, and I'll figure out the header. Uh, I craft a pack with five, and then some little bit of padding, and then the data that you want to uh, do. Which five actually crafted the packet to create a desktop shortcut with the name, and you can also pin it to the link back. Uh, so the uh, outcome of that, if you use that um, uh, type of request, you can start controlling things. You can start making links. You can start. Uh, the second one is retrieve drive information, get the OS service back with no authentication whatsoever in the server. So that can be a problem, especially when someone is messing with your uh, you know, infrastructure stuff. And there's no password, no authentication whatsoever. And another uh, one I was looking at, I was uh, fuzzing it with uh, a small mutation of other I had written. And I got an exception. And the program had an exception handbook that when it handled, when it received an exception, it would be in a safe mode. And when you're thinking of entering safe mode, it's supposed to be safe. It's not. Oh, by the way, you no longer need credentials. So it actually had authentication in the uh, in the server, but when it went to safe mode, it disabled authentication and anyone access it. So the code I wrote for that, um, it just sends, sends three packets, and you send the first one, the second one, I think it's a handshake, and then the third one actually triggers the exception. So you can use this code, it does over SSL too. You can use this code to you know, type a good crash the server, or, uh, make it handle exception, it'll be in your safe mode and no, no more credentials. So, it's another piece of research I was looking at. And uh, yeah, for the past couple of years, I've been dealing with more abilities. Uh, I've been uh, finding bugs and I've been trying to work with some inventors. Uh, not all of them are receptive to more vulnerability reports as you, uh, you might wish. So I found this vulnerability. Uh, it's public. Uh, it's a buffer overflow in processing CSV files in, um, <coughs> in a scale burn. You can look up on XBD if you're familiar. Uh, it's on a, uh, it's in a backend uh, client. So I have a vulnerability. Uh, I sit on it for a while and then I say, okay, I'm going to contact the vendor to see if they'll buy the fix. So I email the vendor and I, uh, I get an email on the website and ask them who is the appropriate person to. Uh, about security uh, or those. They say, you know, you can talk to me, that's fine, what do you have? So I say, I found this vulnerability, I found this buffer overflow in the backend client, and um, I would like to work with you on getting it fixed. So they asked for more information, and I said, you know, I continue to prove a concept if you like, and you can test it out yourself. So one of the, this is just some of the, my favorite quotes, kind of uh, funny ones like that, but it just, it, it's kind of proved that not only they're not only receptive, it's they don't know what's going on sometimes in a flat way. So the first one I got back, I'm not sure what this Perl script is trying to do. And full disclosure, the Perl script was trying to create the malicious file to crash the program. But I mean maybe they didn't know Perl, that's fine. I never had this Perl, but I mean, it was just funny that they would write me that back without even doing more research. So so again uh, I've done one again and everything. The CSV file is edited manually, but it may not parse scripts and then it's loaded. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your return address is smashed. You, you know what a bugger is, probably not. But, uh, so at this point, 
I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to work more with them. I'm used to having a security contact to work with, and those, at least, I guess, take things seriously, and, and those have some debugging skills, have some uh, vulnerability experience. So I'm sending this guy links, I'm sending him, you know, what best workflow is, what client side vulnerabilities are, um, explain, you know, do my best to explain what's going on, which, you know, I probably should have did it in the first place, but I, I, I gave him some more credit. So, my next uh, response was something like, come on, I can see there's no security vulnerability in our product. If the CSV file is invalid, then the application will not run correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I never get tired of reading that, I really don't. It's, uh, so, I, I'm kind of, I'm sitting there thinking, what can I do to help him? What, what else can I say? So, I start, I start looking things up, I start, uh, I'm sending some more links. Um, I'm going to send some more information. I'm going to reiterate my point that this is a security vulnerability, um, not this way possible. And you know, I, I'm interested in getting this fixed. Now I can see. You, yeah, I think the next one. I sent him the exploit code. I said I can see the exploit code that uh, executes. Uh, I think it was open the port, uh, uh, open the shell on the port. Uh, please, that's not supposed to happen when you run a file. You know, well, that's, that's the file. So. Next response, which is uh, not my favorite. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks, but please don't waste my time. <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of finger guns to the head there. Um, not exactly very nice. At the time, you know, I've been working with this guy for a few days and kind of taking this forward, but I'm trying to just, you know, to not uh, quit on him. But eventually, I just said, okay, you know, if, if he's going to tell me not to waste the time, I'm you know, trying my best to explain this to him. I'm just going to release it. So, I write an email, not so far I can, saying, you know, if, if you're not, if you don't take the security vulnerability after everything I've uh, you know, talked to you about, uh, you know, I'm just going to release it. You know, maybe they'll get some more support for people to actually use your product and let you know, uh, try to change your mind. So, I send the email, not so far possible, I get this back. That sounds like a threat, Jeremy. Are you expecting me to pay you something? <laughs> um, so I think I sent you know, something like, I don't even know why you would say that. I mentioned nothing about you paying me. I'm literally spending my time. I spent like a week working with you on this. But uh, I, like, I, I'm releasing it, whatever. So I released the vulnerability about a week later. I told them I'd give them you know, a week if they want to change their mind. I would give them you know, a week's time. And if they did, then I'll just go and you know, let the public know about it. So I released it, and uh, I think two, two or three days later, um, there was a patch, which was good. Uh, I think ISC server was on pretty bad about it, and uh, maybe some of, the, some of their clients called on it, but I tried. So uh, in the end, it was you know, not what they hoped for, but we, we got a patch out of it, so it was good. So that brings me to possible security underwear in your Q&A. Uh, kind of going on the note of what we just uh, looked at, here's some things you may encounter if you uh, ever try to work with a leader yourself, and I don't recommend it. Um, I've got several security vulnerabilities in your products, information time passes. What are your plans regarding your patch? Yeah, what's going on? It's been uh, two months, I still have heard back, what's going on? Then they say, product A is accessible from the internet, so it's not vulnerable to attacks. Okay. Disagree. So, what if someone owns a workstation on the same Sunday with an IA exploit? I'm wondering what they'd be saying now. Literally, that's it. And maybe a typical black hat. Like everyone's favorite picture of this book. Uh, as long as you don't open untrusted files for product AG, the exploits can't harm your system. <laughs> I'm not sure who wrote that. Um, I didn't, but. Do you really want to risk the organization's security by trusting that someone will open a file that can be found on the web, email, or drop to a trusted location? This is real stuff. My side of vulnerabilities are more popular than ever. And that, that first statement is completely wrong. And that guy will open any file you send him, I promise. <laughs> he, was not even, he was on the phone five minutes ago. I don't know if I'm sorry. Uh, product ABC uses a complex proprietary protocol to which its documentation is only circulated internally. I think few of us have heard this one before. Um, so, 
what is the stop tool and using the packet sniffer and just a simple to analyze the protocol, figure out how it works, and spend some time researching that basically. Which is what I do with my uh, free time pretty much. <laughs> so those are the things maybe you, you'll get to someday, hopefully not, and you can come back with answers. And who doesn't want six monitors? I do mean, that is an awesome picture. So why do we put all this chaos software? Why and why why am I here? Why why do I care so much that these things are so vulnerable and I like having running water and electricity? Um, who knows? Um, Stuxnet, I will mention one slide of Stuxnet. I apologize to those who have been played out the ears with it. One slide. Stuxnet, Stuxnet used a Siemens WinCC hard coded database for digital vulnerability, along with you know some uh, the Windows ones, but this one in particular X WinCC. This is one of the most popular uh, software packages for uh, the HMI uh, operators. How many other vendors do this? I mean, now, it, it's one of the most popular vendors uh, and one of the most popular software packages when CC did this. I mean, how many other people do this? Um, we need to know. It's, it's great. Uh, the first being the buddy of mine, Kenneth Finisher, which has the most awesome program in the world. They will have an innocent glass they're cool too. But, um, he, here's a quote I like from him. If you have one, say that it's only outlaws will have to get exports. So they get very true. Uh, Kevin said that in 2008, after he released a Scitex scale vulnerability information, he found a um, buffer overflow in the uh, OBD, OCDD service, which is like a database server that a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people use for a lot of different software suites. But uh, he released the paper, if you're interested too, uh, all, the, uh, all the details about it. And Scitex actually told him that. I don't, I don't know if they want to release a patch or something like that, but I remember reading, you read the paper that they said because it wasn't accessible from the internet normally. I like, said something like it was supposed to be a firewall in place, so you weren't supposed to be able to access the port to own the server. Acts like it wasn't a vulnerability, which drove me nuts, and him too. I mean, it's probably them to release that, but you can figure out more if you're interested on the paper. So, I just want to say too, if you find one of those in scanner products, IC Cert has been really good. I've worked with them uh, the past year or so, uh, working with vendors and getting stuff patched. And they seem to actually care. Uh, they're actually a very good uh, organization. I know we, uh, there may be uh, a local cert in Switzerland and, and other countries as well, but IC Cert is the one that deals with, uh, they work for the DHS in the US, and they deal with a lot of uh, scale up more abilities. So they're really good to work with if uh, you ever find something in the area. So I want to go into some mob list buzzing. Um, I'm going to show a script that I use as a simple mutation buzzer uh, that I use to actually found something. Um, not uh, extremely valuable, but it was interesting. Um, so you'll have to you know, pre, pre this a little bit, but uh, the M, there's two parts, the uh, mob dust protocol, uh, the, the simple the version one or version two. Uh, in the MBAP, which is the first part of the request, and the transaction ID protocol, uh, ID, length, and unit number. And the length, very important. I always, always pay attention to lengths because they are fun to work with. And then you have the function ID, which is three. I think it's uh, I think three to three, or write one of those. It doesn't really matter. But uh, by count, which is the count of uh, the data after that. And then you have two bytes of data, of course. And what the script does is just, uh, first of all, puts them both together. And then it uh, picks, uh, well, the, the puzzle goes, more down there, but this is more just to look at the protocol. But it does a mutation, just picks uh, random places, what I had in my version at least, to fuzz. And ended up fuzzing the link and found something in a uh, server package. And I said, you, you run the uh, fuzzer, wait a few seconds. And I got this crash, which I ended up researching it, and I was able, well, I, the reason I say it wasn't extremely valuable is because I could only write a few nulls. Uh, to the server um, on the stack. So at this point, I must have seen a big link and it tried to write off of the allocated stack. So it tried to, you know, the instruction, you go back to uh, 408, 32C, and you look, look at the instruction as something like a, a move, you know, data from here to there, and it was trying to reference the memory at uh, 3600, which uh, it was allowed to, so it hit the route. So, also, I was looking at, uh, if you were looking at earlier, the 
magic problem that we see Tumblr. I was looking at this probably maybe the first or second time I actually mentioned the name because uh, uh, one of those I found before weren't exactly public, but a lot of them become becoming public now through ISC search, so I can talk about it a little bit more. But this is the Tumblr protocol, which I haven't done any documentation on, so pretty much uh, reversed it. I used Wireshark for most of it. I didn't use I that much, but still the same person. Um, so I actually got a good look at the protocol. And the connection starts out with the connection handshake. You have the header, the signature, one, two, three, four, length, count, message ID, then you have the body where the packet data is in Unicode, and then you have the trailer, which whoever wrote this, I thought it was pretty, I did pretty cool. I've never seen B E A D as a trailer. It's cool, like the packet's dead. So that's pretty cool. Um, and one, two, three, four starting out is also interesting. Um, that's the connection handshake that goes from the client to the server. And then you have the session handshake, which is the server to client, and it actually, actually asks the question, do you really care? <laughs> so whoever wrote this, this is, pretty, uh, this is one of the funnest ones to, uh, to discover, it's pretty cool. Uh, so send that message, it asks do you really care. And also has a message ID, as you can see. And it's human. Uh, the client sends back to the server. Uh, X, or I think that's actually the session, yeah, X, Y. So I don't know if that was me together or what, but uh, it might be like a talk with your girlfriend or something. Um, so that's the next part. And then the session handshake complete. Um, the client sends it back to the server, and they exchange some more data, but uh, in the meat of the packet body, you see the user, uh, computer, name, uh, IP address, everything like that. So, uh, if you're looking at Magicom IBC, here is the basic specs of the uh, packets uh, exchanged. And I also was fuzzing this one and came up with a crash. Uh, it wasn't exploitable, uh, but it was just uh, fun to look at. I think it was a new copy to a great new SD. Uh, so it's taking data from the ESI, the EDI, and you probably can't see it, but uh, I have sent, I guess, B's in the, uh, as the payload. So here, there, B2. So it's Taking Unicode data from a uh, copy and probably a new copy or a custom copy routine, most of the time it's a new copy, you can see a great group that's data from ESI to source to destination. Uh, this is the immunity debugger, you can see if you want to which debugger it was. Uh, so that's kind of a little rant. I think this can be fun, or not fun, or useful. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe I should have listened to that and kind of adopted it already. Not only data protocols, but this is more fun than a lot of protocols. So, I did have a demo, I'm sorry. Um, my virtual machine got corrupted uh, before I got here. So, I did have a demo of a framework I was working on to export some scale stuff. But uh, I won't have it, I'm sorry. Um, don't kill me or anything. So, I'm going to recommendations. Vendors, um, try to break it before you ship it. Because other people are going to do that, trust me. Like, I've mean, been doing it for a while. Uh, and check out this awesome book called uh, The Art of Security Software Assessment. I don't know if you have a copy, if you don't, it's not that expensive. I think it's $60, $90, something like that. But it's a really good book. It's like a, if you already know a lot about vulnerabilities, you can use the reference. But if you don't, it's a really good starting point, especially if you're developing software. And clients, you should definitely do a security evaluation before you make the purchase because you know, stuff happens, vulnerabilities happen. Uh, we recommend that before you invest all this money on a piece of software and know they're not going to just make you upgrade and spend another $10,000 for a new version instead of just releasing a patch, which makes more sense. <coughs> and please don't back up your software and know who you are. Um, keep coming out all the time, go back to And say, although many of you do not all scan features have free trials. Hard to get my hands on some of this stuff, it really is. So if you want them and like a product device, contact me. I'd love to break your software. So and that's all I got. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Any of my email, if you'd like to email me here, just take part of that question.
Who can work this back row? <laughs> now, I think we got one in the presentation. You heard me. You heard me say that row. So, if you think, hey, I'm not looking back at you, he's, he had a great one. Beyonce Knowles, she's super hot, so I wonder. Kevin was me, and then the bowling battle hot. You may be accepted. I'm not sure. It was good. Kind of redhead throw that was kind of awesome.
grades all that. Any more questions? Okay, well thank you for